Hello and welcome. I'm Paul Kilmer, Director of Public Programs at the National Building Museum in Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us from the DMV and from all over the country. We're glad to have you with us. For those of you who may not know about us, the National Building Museum inspires curiosity about the world we build for ourselves through groundbreaking exhibitions and programs such as this. Since earlier this year, we've been relying on an online platform to bring you informative, incisive, and intelligent content. This online edition of the Museum's Spotlight on Design series is no exception. For over 15 years, Spotlight on Design has featured architects, landscape architects, and designers of distinction. The series is sponsored by the Riveda Foundation of the Logan family, and we are truly grateful for their continuing support. Before we get started, I want to mention a couple of up, um, upcoming programs that you might find interesting. Next Monday, we present our first online book talk featuring science writer Emily Anthe's book, The Great Indoors, The Surprising Signs of How Buildings Shape Our Behavior. She explores how our built world affects our mental and physical well-being, our productivity, and our behavior. And the Spotlight on Design series continues on November 10th with a look at the New York City-based architecture firm ODA Architects. You can find out more information about these two programs and purchase tickets at nbm.org. Finally, a few technical notes to mention. We are recording this live broadcast and an edited version of the program will be available on the museum's website within 10 days. Closed captioning is available as an option to you by clicking the closed caption button in your window. And finally, send us your questions via the Q&A button and we'll do our best to get them answered in the time we have together. And now, please join me in welcoming Dan Kaplan, FAIA, who is senior partner with FX Collaborative Architects. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Thank you, Paul. And, and thanks to uh, the National Building Museum for hosting the Spotlight on Design. It's a wonderful program. We're really, really honored to be part of it. And thank you all for attending there uh, on the world of Zoom. Uh, I'm Dan Kaplan, a senior partner at FX Collaborative. Uh, we're uh, a studio based in New York, uh, and we're committed to all aspects of sustainable city building from, from institutions, to uh, buildings, to infrastructure, and to urban design. Uh, for the DC audience, uh, the National Building Museum is located in DC. You might know us from uh, our work at 555 East Street, uh, 7900 Wisconsin, uh, 7770, uh, hard to get out, <laughs> Norfolk, also in Bethesda, and uh, the Bureau at, uh, and Tyson's. I'm really, really, really pleased to be joined tonight um, by my friend Miriam Harris, uh, who's uh, a developer uh, and a really phenomenal real estate professional who's the developer of 77 Greenwich Street, which we'll talk about tonight. I'm just going to briefly introduce Miriam. Uh, Miriam's the Executive Vice President of uh, Trinity Place Holdings, which is a publicly traded company, and she directs all aspects of uh, the real estate bill, uh, their real estate business. Um, uh, including 77 Greenwich Street. Uh, Miriam has over 22 experience in the industry prior to leading the real estate um, uh, division of, of Trinity Place um, uh, Holdings. She served as executive VP and co-head of real estate transaction services uh, for the New York EDC, which uh, when she was there, she was involved in some really, really transformational and complex public-private land development deals, uh, um, mainly under the Bloomberg administration, um, including Cornell Tech uh, and uh, uh, the Essex Crossing development, which just opened up. Uh, you'll see an image of that in a minute. Uh, Miriam, before that, was also a, a VP at um, for, for commercial development at Forest City Ratner. Uh, and that's where I first met Miriam, where we both worked on the New York Times building together. Um, she and she worked on numerous projects there. So um, I'm really glad to have her. Um, we're going to have a, a chat in a little bit and, and talk about, about this. So um, 
Tonight's program is really a play in three acts. Uh, the first act is uh, an overview of what we call hybrid buildings and uh, issues and, and design uh, strategies around them. Uh, the second act, uh, Miriam and I will be having a fireside chat, uh, sans fire, I hope. <laughs> and uh, and uh, what we'll discuss um, really some of the issues from both uh, a design and urban design, a policy a development uh, point of view. And then the third act, and hopefully it gets um, sprinkled throughout is really questions from you, uh, uh, the audience. Uh, so with that, um, we'll jump into act one. So um, hybrids, uh, what is this, uh, this marriage? Uh, what is this marriage of mission-driven and profit-driven programs? So whether you're a church or a other religious institution or a, um, a, a school or a cultural institution, uh, and you've been in um, the a dense urban center, whether it's Washington, D.C. Or, or New York or Boston or, or any number of places, you could be you could have a facility or an institution that is land rich but cash poor that you really feel like you're sitting on something that has a lot of value and is probably underbuilt. In addition, the facilities might be out of sync with the mission of, of the institution. Maybe you're hemmed in by a physical plant, or an old church, or, or maybe you're hampered by it. Maybe it's, it's, it's too big for, for what you need to do and it's becoming a, a lodestone around the institution's neck. At the same time, even during COVID, uh, developers are always looking for really good pieces of developable land that have value. And there is a scarcity of sites. I mean, that's sort of a definition of a dense urban place where really there's, there's more demand than supply of sites. And um, this is you know, one thing that developers are really looking for. And of course, there's the added the benef benefit of having a a partner uh, that's based in, in the community itself. So that's where our, our notion of hybrids come in. And uh, it's sort of a breed of urban buildings, uh, you know, where you have this overlap of two worlds. You have the, the mission-driven institutional world and the profit-driven developer world. And where they overlap, there's a win-win situation where they can co-locate in the same building. And there's some very, very interesting design and technical issues that arise. Now, this is not a new um, concept. Um, on the left is Bertram Go uh, Goodhue's um, convocation tower uh, that was uh, drawn by, by the great Hugh Ferris uh, and in, in the 20s and uh, in, in the 70s, uh, Hugh Stubbins City Corp Center with uh, with uh, St. Peter's Lutheran Church at the bottom of it. And the red here are the, are the institutions. And I, and I think the, slide, the, the image on the left is really more representative of what we're talking about, where there's a real integration uh, between the two uses and as opposed to the one on the right, where there's really a concept of separation. Folks in DC should not be, um, uh, you know, this should not become news to you. There, there is uh, there's really an interesting number of these projects that are emerging. Um, you have the Third Church of, uh, of Christ Science uh, and, and the office building at 16th Street uh, by Robert Stern. Um, the wonderful um, building um, that uh, uh, Cunningham Quill designed for um, the first Congregational uh, United Church at 10th and G and uh, 10 Architectos is uh, a West End Square 50 with squash and a fire department and housing up above. So the, this no, notion of hybridity is, is, is in, in the air. Miriam is, of course, as I said, is, is well versed in this building type as well. The Hilton and Times Square, which was really um, you know, seven late levels of, of theaters uh, and including a historic theater with a hotel on top, the New York by Gary building with a public school at the bottom and residential on top. And, the recently opened Essex Crossing with a great public market at the bottom. And then finally on, on your right is 77 Greenwich, which we'll talk a lot about tonight. So our practice FX Collaborative has really um, spent a lot of time in the last 10, 15 years um, looking at this building type. 
35XV uh, on the upper left-hand corner is a, is a school extension of Xavier High School with a residential tower above. Uh, 77 Greenwich is uh, in the middle of the top is, a, is also a residential tower with a public school at the bottom, a 450 seat public school. On the top right is Willoughby Square, uh, which is as a public school at the bottom and an office building above. La Hermosa I'll talk a little bit about later on um, is a church and a music school with residential above. And there's a church in Midtown Manhattan right now, which we're designing that has an office building above. And finally, uh, Fifth on the Park, which we completed about 15 years ago is the largest new church in um, uh, Manhattan, 2000 seat uh, a, a gospel Baptist assembly church with uh, uh, a residential tower, a condominium tower, and affordable housing on top of it. So this, we're in this this realm, and we've learned some lessons. And um, what are what are the uh, what are the engineering and design considerations? Um, what what are what are the issues that come up? And, and so the first, and I think most interesting is. Um, really it's a design problem um, and an architectural problem is, a, is one of identity. Uh, how does each one of these uses um, uh, assume pride of place uh, in the overall composition? So we, we've sort of come up with a few, let's say stratagems. Um, the first is what we call the Janus face, which is, you know, two, every culture has, has one of these um, uh, deities where it's a two-headed deity, and one deity for, forms a backdrop to the other, so there are two faces. There's no front and back. Uh, I think 77 Greenwich is a, is a perfect illustration of that. Um, this is a good strategy when there's a big piece of land, like or with, with multiple frontages, I should say. Uh, so it, this is sort of a diagram of the building. The purple and is the institution, a 450-seat public school, new build, but also in a renovation of a historic uh, uh, Federalist house called the Dickey House at the base of the building. Um, there's, there's retail in blue. And then the yellow is the residential portion of the building with the entrance on Granite Street and the tower above. So we had the luxury of a site with multiple frontages. So we really put the two frontages at the direct opposite. So the, the residential is sort of upper right and the school is lower left. So as that plays out from an identity point of view, as you, as you move around the building, here is the, the historic school and the, and the base of, of the residential building, which is really meant to be ambiguous in its reading and, and really feel like a residential building. And then the entrance to the residential on that side is really, you know, monumental, says front door, is a modern uh, take on the sort of great Art Deco uh, vertical portals that you find in, in these type of buildings and really create a sense of, sense of arrival. Um, as we start moving around the building, the residential building sort of starts to push out towards the harbor and step out over the, 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 the historic uh, building reaching reaching towards the views and 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 really creating a flat iron effect. As we turn further, um, the building becomes more institutional, becomes the front, the second front for for the school itself. Um, and even though it's residential above, it has a much more um, let, um, sort of institutional feel with longer, larger windows and stair halls and canopies and so forth and entrance courts that really say school and, and, and civic presence. The second type is what we call the shapeshifter, which is, this is this famous uh, gestalt uh, drawing that I'm sure everybody's seen in, in uh, art and architecture school where you either read this as a older woman with a thin lips and a large nose and a, and a scarf or a young woman with a, a chin and ear and uh, looking in profile. And so depending, has a dual reading. And I think uh, 35XV, our project for Xavier High School is a, is a great illustration of that. Um, it's a expansion of the high school at the base and a, a residential tower up above. Very complex structure, very um, interesting response to the zoning 
uh, where um, the tower up above really conformed to the to the slope and the, the base of the building in purple was really um, the, the institution. The interesting thing about these buildings with, with, with the sky exposure plane is the closer you get to them, the, the more the upper portion of the building fades away. And the base of the building, which is uh, really the, the residential entrance below and the school above is, again, purposely ambiguous. And I think this is a great illustration of the, of the shape shifter, which is where the um, resident walking into the, to the building or a visitor could just as easily mistake this window as a, a residential window as it would be, um, as they could um, think of it as the school. And somebody walking out of the school might just never understand that this is a residential building. So that there's a sort of purposeful ambiguity where um, that, that really um, makes this thing tick. The, uh, it really comes together at the, the main entrance, which is it's very sculptural, exciting, um, dramatic carving of stone uh, at the entrance. And then these two slits of windows above were actually the, um, the uh, uh, windows into the, the school band room, which uh, you'd never know walking in, but looking out, you clearly they get some natural light. Another, another shape shifter is a project we just got approved on the uh, northeast corner of Central Park uh, for um, the La Hermosa Church, which is a really interesting church. It was the birthplace of Latin jazz. Tito Puente um, gave his first concerts there, and they really were hemmed in by a very, very small um, uh, facility, and they wanted to expand and also, of course, take advantage of their wonderful, wonderful site with views over Central Park. Um, here, it was very clear from, from a planning, urban design, and entitlement point of view that this really wanted to have both a reading of a civic building and a reading of a, a residential building. So in terms of the vocabulary, it's not quite clear where one stops and the other starts. And we use the device of a sort of arced vi uh, vertical fins to to really create the sort of um, uh, blending of, of the two uh, that also had, was really great from a solar control point of view for the, for the really five or 600 uh, person um, uh, religious hall looking out on Central Park, controlling for glare and so forth on Sunday morning so that it worked outside in and inside out. And, you know, you can really see this notion of, of of dual readings where on the more to the left you get the more religious and, and more civic it gets on the right, the more of an, a, a sort of classic residential entrance you get, whereas you would not know where the seam was between the two buildings. Finally, the last, the last stratagem is, is what we call the chameleon, uh, which is really great for very dense sites. Um, this is a, a church in an office building uh, in Manhattan, uh, 150 feet of frontage, no back, no front, and how did this, uh, fairly large, about 250,000 square feet, so how did this sort of large concentration of, of people and density get sorted out? And, you know, the insight here was that um, one does not usually appreciate buildings in Manhattan dead on. And it, you're usually in most, most urban places with streets, you really appreciate them obliquely. And so we used again, the device of the vertical fin as a, as a sort of neutral um, the, uh, element that allowed us to um, create the, this building. So when you got closer to the church, all of a sudden it would appear more ecclesiastical and, and, and really have the iconography of a church and with the wishbone arches incised in and, and the vertical Gothic recall. And of course, of course, the iconography of the cross. And when you got closer to the resident uh, for the to the office building, it assumed much more of the classic, um, you know, uh, office building iconography with its um, canopy and, and both reintroducing the fins, but really, really saying office building. So those are some of the de architectural design identity issues, but so much of these buildings, how they tick is really about the organization uh, and, and how does each, each use have a sort of go to a, like a win-win situation where they're mutually beneficial. And 
you know, for the nonprofits or the civic or the institutional uses being street oriented is a, is a real, real benefit. And for the for profit, you know, whether it's residential or office, having the light, the air, the views, of course, is a um, is a real benefit for them. So it really um, it, it, this is where you get the win win situation. That's back to 77 Greenwich, um, the school, a 450 seat uh, um, public school, was designed by Datner uh, uh, Architects, uh, a New York City firm, very fine firm, who we were very happy to collaborate on this project with. And you can see from their building stack that they located um, the, the lower uh, grades closer to the street and, and the court and the, the administration and so forth higher up. So again, reinforcing the sense of street activation and, and civic presence. Um, up above in 77 Greenwich though, it's all about the views. It's a really a view machine. And really with, with the views, the, the whole, the whole um, organization of the residential plan as a single loaded, as a single loaded core um, with the step format that really worked with the wedge shaped site, so that every major, every major room got a wraparound corner facing this harbor, the sunset, the Statue of Liberty, and then culminating in this butterfly roof, which you can see in this image and parenthetically in my virtual backdrop, but uh, really the, the letting out, you know, really illustrating the issue of this mutual beneficial arrangement. And of course, even higher in the building with, with common shared outdoor spaces. From a vertical circulation point of view, generally the elevators from the two uses are kept separately and the lobbies are kept separate so that you really are just two intertwined uses. Sometimes the stairs are separate, sometimes they're they're combined, uh, but it's really always um, to be thought of as like these two intertwined worlds and generally they do not uh, inter interact. The next issue we, we encounter all the time is um, long span spaces. Uh, this is that uh, Baptist Gospel Assembly in Harlem uh, where, you know, this is sort of the trade-off um, you know, this is, has 80, 90 uh, foot free spans to allow for this, this uh, 2000 seat uh, space, but above is a 25 story building. So it's in, a, in essence, you're building a foundation twice. Um, almost all these civic programs have long span spaces back to 77 Greenwich. Um, this is the, what we did to provide for um, the gym, the cafeteria that Datner then uh, designed on the inside, but it really illustrates, you know, that that's a 10 foot high steel truss that holds up the 400 foot tower and then the steel beams below really um, creating that open space. Mechanically, there's potential for shared systems or independent systems. Um, there's synergies to be had there. Um, it's, it's interesting. It really has to do with, with the type of use up above and, and down below. Um, the development process, it, it's really um, interesting how uh, this adds a level of complexity and um, that has to be, it has to be choreographed through, through the process. And I think it all starts with the basic value proposition. As I said at the, at the outset, if, you, if you're an institution and you're a school, a private school or, uh, or that has a piece of land and a or a church as a piece of land, and let's say the, the district, uh, uh, Washington DC, and you think you're sitting on a, a, a real gold mine of, of development rights, there's a value proposition there where the value of what could be built on that site has to be greater than the cost of the build back of the facility and the additional complexity with the long span structures and Sometimes there's relocation and that has an impact of costs and, and sometimes people want an endowment afterwards. So just really all these are the dials that need to be turned and they're really a, they're really a uh, development, uh, planning, architecture and, and structural interaction to, to, to optimize it. And um, it really has to do with the, how valuable the, the, the development rights are, um, how, how 
big the institution wants to build back, the, of course, a smaller institution is less expensive than a bigger one. Have a location. Are there great views? Is it like a case like uh, La Hermosa, where they're trading? You know, they're they're really trying to grab the value of of those wonderful uh, views of Central Park and really use it to enhance the mission of of the institution. And you know, really, I think that's that's a key takeaway for me for for these institutions is there's got to be clarity because, you know. Um, is it is it about providing affordable housing or is it about providing a new in, you know home for the institution or is it about providing a desired endowment so sometimes those work together but often they work at cross purposes where be, and a lot of times it is a, a, a you know a single pot and and you're really it's a zero sum game so you really have to really fine tune your your priorities um, so um, this is uh, the structure is quite interesting. The 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 legal structure, um, you know, the 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 perception is on the left where you think, well, there's the institution and that gets built, and then the the developer builds on top, and obviously it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, the really the developer builds the building, and the institution becomes uh, almost like a in essence, um, from a construction and a handoff point of view, almost like a tenant, we call it the white box, so that the developer delivers a custom built shell and core for the institution. And then the institution then goes ahead and fits it out, like in the case of the school where um, FX Collaborative did the yellow and Datner did the pink, or the, the purple. Uh, you know, the, the definition of the white box is very, very important and it really is becomes a sort of part of, of the description of the land. Um, it deals with areas and heights and underside of structure and where the long spans are. So it's really, it's really a customized um, core and shell that will accept a very particular type of fit out and also deals with things like well, what does the handoff look like? Is there a temporary CFO? Is, it a, is there some fit out that gets done by the developer and so forth? So finally, before, before we finish up this act of the play, um, there's, some, there's some implications, there's some larger implications for uh, city building. And I, I really love this photograph of 35 XV on 16th Street because it shows a real dialogue across, uh, you know, the 1800s, 1900s, uh, 2000s, uh, uh, of architecture of this institution across time. And we, you know, we purposely sculpted the tower to have this sort of resonance and this, 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 this um, dialogue. And it really shows how it fits into a, a larger cityscape. And, you know, I had this sort of, in a way, eureka moment, um, had the privilege of going to Guangzhou and going to the uh, International Finance Center about three, four years ago, back when we all could travel. And uh, it's, this is one of those super talls that you find in Asia. It's uh, a office building with a um, hotel stacked on top and a very active um, uh, space in between. But you, when, you, when you arrive at the building, it's, the street life is completely dead. And there's, you find yourself, uh, we had dinner up, up here in, in the base of, of the hotel. Um, and it was wonderful and it was thriving. And there was, there, there was a lot of activity and you know it's really what I call an extroverted use, and but that was located high up, you know, in the air. So when you really were down at the bottom and you arrived, uh, either by foot or by car, the the street life was non-existent. And this is a very very dense urban downtown. So in contrast, I you know I think these hybrids uh, point a really nice way where you have extroverted uses, really enhancing street realm and, and, and street vitality, neighborhood vitality. And you have the more introverted uses higher up taking advantage of the light and air. And um, I think it's a great, it's a great model. And, um, uh, you know, especially in this current COVID um, world where we're relying all the time on street activation generally by, by retail, um, the idea of institutions um, uh, occupying the, the activating the, the public realm in a, in a bigger way um, seems like an appealing direction. So with that, I thank you and
invite Miriam up on the virtual stage. Hello. Hello, that was great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So Paul's going to join us also. And, and please do um, lob in your Q&As. Um, uh, and um, as, as Miriam and I chat with each other. So I think I'll, I'll start it off. Um, so, um, you know, Mary, I've just been so impressed with your, your career in terms of um, wearing both a policy hat and a public sector hat and also uh, a developer hat and a private sector hat and really seeing both sides of the coin. And, um, you know, I, I would love to know, um, you know, putting on your policy hat, you know, do you think that hybrids make good city building policy? And then as a putting your, you know, developer hat on, um, you know, what can city government and policy do to promote these and make them easier to build? Sure. Um, so, so I think hybrid buildings are, are key to good city building. And I'm so excited that Dan has branded them now so I can use that term um, to, to, to sing their praises to other people. Um, I mean, as you noted, they're so important because they support public sector civic uses at the base of the building to activate public spaces in a, you know, and sustaining the community uh, and keeping those uses in the community. Um, through um, you know uh, positive for-profit uses, um, you know that enhance in their architectural stature when they're designed by Dan, but also as taxpayers. You know um, the public uses are not the taxpayers, and so putting that all on um, you know very uh, in very dense areas where there's a scarcity of sites um, just maximizes the benefit for the public. Um, you know I've worked on two very success, successful examples of this that you showed in your slides um, that I wanted to touch on briefly um, because they were very large policy statements by the city of New York as well. The first was the 42nd Street Development Project. And if everyone in the audience, again, something that we're missing terribly has gone to Broadway. You know, over the years, it's changed quite a bit. And that's because of the 42nd Street plan that the state and the city of New York implemented to preserve theaters that were um, in very tough shape and were not economically feasible um, to support them and to reactivate that area for positive uses. So, you know, the project I worked on, there were theaters and we put a hotel on top. Um, and the other project um, that uh, was a very large scale plan in a similar matter, not just a building, um, is the project that you mentioned uh, that I also worked on for the city of New York, which was called Essex Crossing. Um, originally that project was called Seward Park because it was in this neighborhood on the Lower East Side that was called Seward Park. Um, and this was land that was cleared 60 years ago by Robert Moses, who I would think at the National Building Museum, I don't have to explain who that is. And it was laid fallow because it was supposed to be part of that famous expressway that never happened because Jane Jacobs and others were successful in fighting it. Um, and because of politics, starting then and going for 60 years, it was completely parking garages for that long. And what the city did is they came in this last time after years of trying and failing to redevelop it. And they reconceived an area with the community trying to figure out what they wanted, but also trying to make it economically sustainable. And what that resulted in were these very thoughtful hybrid buildings. Um, and those two experiences made me realize that our project at 77 Greenwich, which is a building alone, but it is in a place on a block where it really takes up a lot of urban space um, because it has three sides, um, would be exceptionally successful with a school at the base and the for-profit condominium apartments above. It really showed me the way. Um, but what was so important about those projects in particular um, was that the public sector came first in those examples. And that order of operation, I've come to realize is key for these projects when they're at the large scale. Um, 
you know, sometimes uh, government entities say, here, we've got this land, developers come in, tell us what you're gonna do, we'll sell it to you, go do it. Um, and the problem with that, it's not always a problem, mm -hmm. but the problem with that is you, first of all, don't get as much community buy-in. And you also, as a city, don't have a lot of policy impact with things you wanna think about that you want, that the community wants, but also, you can tend to leave uh, money on the table as well as a, as a governmental entity, unless you determine what kind of development you want. Um, and in particular, in that example, which was Essex Crossing, as Dan mentioned, there was this incredible public market. Again, that these markets had started in, in you know under LaGuardia because they wanted to take these unsafe outdoor markets and put them inside. But over the years, the market had become a complete anachronism. It was unsuccessful. Um, it was very hard to use, but at the same time, it had some wonderful vendors and people wanted to preserve it as part of the neighborhood and try to figure out how to develop the neighborhood, but not over gentrify it, right? We all have been talking about gentrification a lot lately. Um, and this was the way, because what we did was we sold the land to a developer, but we said, you have to sell this part back to us as a public market. Um, and, and they did that. And not only did they want to do that because they wanted the land, they also believed this was a positive development project. It would help their development. Um, and we were able to negotiate by setting that out first that the original folks who were in the older market could come back at the same rents. We could do preservation. Um, and the city owns a commercial condominium unit in this new building now. So. The policy question is important. Um, I, I wasn't always a believer that the city should set everything out first, that they were the experts. I still don't think they're the experts, but I think with community input and doing a large scale plan first, um, the, the projects end up being more successful for everyone, including the developers. Mm. Now, not every project is large scale like that. Um, a lot of the projects that um, Dan mentioned are, are, are single buildings, right? Um, and those are, those are very successful as well. And a lot of those buildings that he mentioned happen to be in prominent parts of the city um, and have those Janus features. They're on three different blocks, things like that. Um, and in those cases, the city really could be very helpful as well. Um, as, as Dan mentioned, he often has to rezone the property on a single basis um, to, to develop it for, what, for these hybrids. And as we all know, zoning traditionally is about one use here, one use there. Um, and that's not what we're doing here. And the city can be very helpful in supporting those with their zoning. And um, not to get too in the weeds, but um, building codes do not necessarily like hybrid buildings. And there's a lot of fire safety issues. And I would think if a city really wanted to like embrace hybrid buildings per se, um, not just case by case buildings or large scale plans, they would really look at their building code as well and say, how can we do this safely and change some of our, our biases, which are for single use buildings in the codes as well. Um, and Dan, you touched on that, you know, certificates of occupancy and how that works. You know, in most, I think in most municipalities, you get a single certificate of occupancy for a building, right? Um, but that doesn't work with hybrids. And so I think cities can really do a lot thinking about that if they want to promote these type of buildings. That's so, that's so wise. Well, one follow up, you said something about the Essex Crossing, which, which um, uh, may be curious. Uh, you, you said that the developers saw the market as an enhancing use to the offering up, upstairs. I, I was, I'm just really curious of, um, you know, all the issues of separation of uses aside and giving two faces and two fronts. Um, I, you know, what's the sense of, of your market research and bu discussions with buyers about how they feel uh, at 77 Greenwich about having a school at the bottom? It, it, it's such a good question. So before we even started talking to buyers, we interviewed, you know, the folks that are going to sell the apartments for us. And before we chose the firm that we we're working with, we asked a lot of different firms. Not one said it was a negative. Hmm. They said it was a positive. It's an amenity to the building. Um, and even if you don't have a child and you're thinking of resale value of your apartment, you think, oh, this is good. Someone else will like it because their child can go around the corner and such things. 
Um, I think that uh, when, when you have those kind of mix of uses, there are some other things you mentioned that are really important. You said, in our particular case, it lifted the apartments 150 feet off the air. So our first floor is 150 feet off the air. So from a developer's point of view, you don't have any bad views. You don't have those hard apartments that are at a larger that are larger and that are hard to design at the base of a building. Um, so, so that's that's really important. The other thing, from a financial point of view, um, is your third in, in in our particular case, but in every case, it essentially means you're a third in this building pre-sold. So anyone who's doing a, a hybrid building, you know, and they need to get financing, they need to raise money, they can say to people, look. Uh, a third of the uses, a quarter of the uses, 10% of the uses is already in effect pre-sold. And that's a positive from financing these buildings as well. So it's from a financial point of view, it's from a marketing point of view. Um, and like you mentioned, it's from a civic point of view. Um, these buildings activate a ground floor in a way that a residential building doesn't. And in this day and age, not as much retail will as well. So I think that's super important uh, for attracting people to your neighborhood to buy apartments or rent apart apartments in your building or for office leasing space to say there's activity here, it's safe 24 seven, there's eyes on the street, all those things that you're talking about. So like you said, it's a win-win. I do, uh, if you don't mind, um, we have been getting questions and- uh, um, Go for it, yeah. <laughs> I would be super remiss uh, for not asking a question from one of our dear, uh, founding trustees, Cynthia Field, who's asking, uh, what do you envision will happen uh, when institution missions change? Will the change have any effect on the residential identity? Um, so uh, thanks for asking or answering that question. Well, we better make a good answer since it's a family. <laughs> so you mean over time an institution changes what they do? Is that the question? Their mission, yeah, for, for example? I think so. I goes from a, a, a for question. example, if it goes from a school, yeah, if it goes from a school to another, uh, you know, sort of institution. It's such an important question. So um, bringing in the legal aspect of these buildings, this is all negotiated. So we have these conversations because we're thinking of the building long term and a lot of them live under um, condominium regimes where everybody's partners in the same building, even though they own their own unit. Um, in this particular building, for example, this, will, this our portion, bottom portion will be owned by the city of New York. Um, and we put restrictions. They can't turn it into, uh, you know, what one might, you know, a Lulu, you know, something that, a use that people don't like. Um, or even limited, I, I don't know for how long, like, I, I don't think they can turn it into a high school. I, I, we put those restrictions on them. Um, and they, they push back, they need flexibility too. And, and I think Dan can speak to this with the not-for-profits not -profit, not he worked with. You know, they need to have a good lawyer who can give them as much flexibility as possible in these documents when they negotiate them, to fight for them, to think forward. You know, we might not be this in 30 years. You know, we have to make sure the agreement allows us to change. So it's really a, the legal regime that you have to look towards. Yeah, and in addition, I think from a from a design and planning point of view, when you talk about nonprofits, when, when you think about the type of spaces that go into these hybrids, um, whether school, um, church, synagogues, um, and so forth, on some level they're very similar. You know, there's long span spaces that are either auditoriums or or sacred spaces. There are a lot of classrooms, um, and you know the amount, um, the the purpose builtness of them, or or the own the, the the how tight of a fit it is for the institution, is a lot of times, you know, in a way over over stated. And um, for instance, at uh, La Hermosa, um, you know, very much part and part of their part and parcel of their mission was to um, be a seven day a week institution and not only a Sunday uh, institution. And um, so the idea was, yes, it's La Hermosa, but, but it's also designed as a music school so that during the weeks and you know, there's after school programs and so forth, 
they can use the the big auditorium and the the larger spaces and the chapel as 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 performance and, and rehearsal spaces and really use this as a community and civic resources so it's it's really um uh you know active over a long period of time so so the basic point is is that yes it might be one institution driving the creation of the space but usually and if it's if it's designed thoughtfully and and pre-thought as miriam suggested that the, it, it should have you know a long life uh, just not only depending on who's who's uh, let's say religious symbol is on on the uh, over the front door you, you know there was one other thing i just wanted to pick up on, on what miriam was saying too about who drives these these projects and you uh, miriam made a really interesting point about the uh, about the uh, city um, really crafting, like taking the first step and uh, saying this is, you know, we're working with the community, this is what we want, and then sending it out to the private sector. It's actually an interesting trend in a lot of the, a lot of the working with the nonprofits um, that we are, that the actually the nonprofits are taking the first step and are even getting the land rezoned and entitled and um, bringing in developer advisors um, but not necessarily bringing in a development partner until, until um, later on in the process. And I, I, I saw a parallel to what you were saying about, let's say, the Essex Crossing planning that was going on, on a community basis, where, you know, a, a, a nonprofit can um, lose control or, or leave money on the table, so to speak, if they're, if they're not in a more of a driver's seat. And um, there's... You know, and, and nonprofits don't build buildings every day, and, and it's not. I mean, we're talking about the success stories, but I think we both can think of examples where it, it got away from an organization, yes. and those are tragic. Um, yes. I know of one in particular where their their space was was destroyed, um, and they still don't have a new building. Right. So you really need folks like Dan and good legal representation and um, taking uh, leadership in advance of the actual transaction to build the building to ensure that, that your, your interest is, is secured. Wanna lob one at me? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I was really interested listening to your conversation about uh, shape-shifting uh, and do you make the building look like two buildings or two uses, or do you make it look like you don't even know what's going on in there? How do you balance those, those uh, criteria? Um, uh, I, I lived through it with you, but I, I candidly, I don't know how much I thought about it. Uh, and I, I'm so interested hearing that, that you thought about it a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think it's so um, both sight and um, use driven um, when there's a very compact and tight site um, you know you really it, it's such an interesting architectural challenge like that that Manhattan church I showed where you know they were really the two front doors were, were really separated by like 50 feet 60 feet and you really had there was it really became a, a really clever thing I mean we um, what was nice about 77 was that there was enough frontage that we could do this sort of gentle you know, transition so that it gently turned from more of the residential to a neutral zone to something that was more, more institutional in, in nature. So I think that one is it's very site driven and two, it's, it's program driven. I, I do think, you know, the very, um, uh, overt um, iconography of religious institutions, you know, crosses, Star of David's domes, things like that, you know, um, close to residential can be, you know, as, you, you know, it can be of concern to residents and, and want a sort of more of a neutral sort of zone, if you will. So, that's different than a school. And as you pointed out before, a, a, a lower school is different than a high school and, and separation. So I really think it, 
it's also about the the two uses and the nature of the two uses and how how much you you keep them separate or or or, or try to blend them yeah and, um no that i mean that makes perfect sense yeah. it's the site constraints and the uses yeah. and that informs how much you decide if they're going to um you know merge together or be very distinct yeah. the other thing that's neat about these buildings from my point of view as a developer is where you can get efficiencies yeah so for example in our building we share a generator with the school which is great because it's a better generator it's a bigger generator and we could share the cost of it and um, that was a huge efficiency cost and usage efficiency for our small relatively small condominium tower that was required to have a generator mm -hmm. um, what are some other efficiencies that people can get in these buildings that you have designed and, and yeah. found? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, everybody gets very um, rightfully concerned about the structural complexity of like these long spans and things like that. But when you think about it, you only have one set of foundations, you know, and um, you only have one set of um, one basement and one point of entry for, for the thing. So those type of those type of things, yes, they might be slightly upsized and, and so forth, but the, the real costs get amortized over both over both uses and, and they're they're efficient. Um, you know, uh, of course, that, that then um, uh, sort of reduces the amount of um, of uh, it just uh, reduces the amount of costs for uh, or gives you enough money to to spend on those those long span spaces. Um, you know, other areas you, you touched on mechanical. Um, it's real interesting about how to, for tall buildings especially, how to bring the cores through the lower levels. And, um, you know, I, we're talking about 77 Greenwich a lot. So, I mean, that was a, had a, you know, a side core. It was a very big piece of structure that came through. And actually, um, from a school planning point of view, you know, took up the middle part of of the fatter part of the site, which was a benefit since the, the depths of the classrooms could be could be right sized around them. So, you know, I, I think in that regard, that was that that was a, a win win. Um, you know, the other going back to your question about identity and, and, and so forth and was uh, you know, it contrasts, let's say, 77 Greenwich with uh, New York by Gary about the different facade treatments in the school. Yeah, no, they took a different approach. Yeah, yeah. so that in the New York by Gary, it was, you know, there is a, a New York City School Construction Authority um, template for for windows and, and, and they have a set of standards, you know, when it's once you see it, you can't unsee it. You know, <laughs> you go, oh yes, that's what that's what they're supposed to look Very like. Very legible. Very legible, and and also materials and so forth. And you know, I, I think we and and I, I think that was sort of baked into Gary's expression. I mean, we took a different tact in, in terms of, you know, I don't think the school would have gotten as nice of a facade, honestly, <laughs> had they been a standalone school, right? And as as opposed to being part of a, of a more monumental structure, um, uh, a taller structure. So, you know, the, the, the window um, configurations, the, the quality of exterior wall, the even probably the thermal performance of the exterior wall, we're, we're all, you know, um, the school got, a, got an enhancement by being part of a, of a big, I know that's the case. Um, at our Willoughby Street project, where there's a school at the bottom of, a, of an office building, where, you know, the the quality of the of the windows and the amount of daylight are, are it, it's it's superior in a way uh, to what uh, a standalone school would have gotten. If I, if I could, yeah. um, along those very same lines, speaking of schools. Um, we've gotten a question from uh, uh, Mbe um, from uh, the University of the District of Columbia, who is asking, what are some of the common complaints uh, from tenants of these buildings that you have used to improve the design of other similar buildings? And a follow-up uh, from probably his professor, 
um, how are natural light and ventilation issues handled? And I think you hinted at that um, just now. Um, well, the, you know, I, I think the issue of noise is a big, <laughs> is, is really um, one of uh, both design and management of, right? So from a design point of view, um, I referenced uh, the band practice room at 35XV um, over the main lobby. Um, you know, obviously great care was taken to um, acoustically isolate that from, from the lobby and, you know, you would never know when the windows are thicker and, and all sorts of, of stuff. So, I mean, I think there is more engineering that goes on and more care in terms of the interface between the two uses. And then the other, of course, is, is, um, is operational um, noise if there is gatherings um, and then this is another reason why you know the site planning aspect is very important and, and why you have like like at 77 where there's really two opposite corners of the site where someone enters and so the kids are gathering or being dropped off on buses and so forth like as far away from the front door as from the residential as as possible so it's really having you know it brings up the issue of of a partnership, um, you are co-locating in a building with um, another entity, and um, you know it's everything could be written down and in legal papers and stuff like that. But it's very important that there's a, you know, there's really seen as a true partnership between the nonprofit and 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 the developer. And and I, I know when nonprofits seek developer partners, they are looking as much to, they think of, think of it like a business partnership, you know, you're looking as much to the, um, the, the trustworthiness and the longevity and the, and the decency of, of your partner as you are for like, well, how much are you getting per square foot? Because you're going to be living with the, the, this group for, for a long, long time. So it's very important. I don't know, Miriam, do you have any Anything no, I mean, I, I should note that all these public schools have outdoor space. And so that's the biggest challenge, how the outdoor space is managed. And um, we do have rules like they can't do movie night at 8 p.m. outdoors on their, you know, gym that's 150 feet in the air. Um, but like Dan said, at the end, it's about relationships. And, and so um, hopefully you know, you'll have a principal who will be, <laughs> you know, sensitive to, to the needs of the rest of the folks in the building. Um, so it's there was a, a, a second part to that question, which was uh, ventilation. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and natural light. Well, I think we touched on the natural light part in a, in a way. I mean, I think, uh, you, you know, in the general urban form, at least in, in New York, it's a little bit different in Washington, but at least in New York, you know, you have bases of buildings and towers. And you know, the issue with bases is they're they're deeper and there's less light penetration into them. And as and as I sort of to alluded to before, the fact that there's a core of a, a use up above going through the base is good in terms of natural light in that, you know, you're creating a you know, you're using up the dark center of, 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 the, of the floor in, in essence to, um, for, for another use and, and you're keeping the light filled perimeter free for, for programming such as, um, such as classrooms. Um, and then up above, as we said before, you're getting the benefit of light and air of the thinner tower uh, up above. Um, you know, um, from a ventilation point of view, you know, this is really something that we've always been conscious of, but especially, um, you know, in the pandemic um, and post-pandemic and pandemic resilient design that we've all been wrestling with, that, you know, ventilation, sources of fresh air, filtration have, have all become, you know, much more top of mind. And, um, you know, uh, and I, I really, I don't remember off the top of my head what we're doing at 77 Greenwich. At, at, at other places there, um, 
I believe at 35 XV, there were independent um, outside air uh, systems, risers that were brought in so that the residential was brought in from one way and the, and the, and the um, school was brought in from, a, from another source. So that they're really, from the outside air point of view, are really uh, acting, separate systems, yeah. acting independently. And, and I, you know, I think we're going to just see a trend in any way, whether it's one use or multiple uses for more, um, uh, more points of entry, you know, more resiliency um, in, in fresh air systems or outside air systems. Of course, everybody has been running around rightfully upping their um, filtration levels uh, in the last, you know, six months from what we did at 77, which was like from a MERV, whatever, if, uh, seven or eight to like 13 or 14, which is the recommended density for from the CDC. So, I mean, that brings us to the big, you know, pandemic question, which I, every, every one of these Zooms, what we have to talk about, which is, I think is, and it's really important and um, whether it's hybrids or not hybrids, um, I was really curious, Miriam, uh, in terms of, you know, your, your point of view, um, you know, you, you're sort of dedicating your whole professional life to city building and, and um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so oh, you're not just going to ask me about air, air filtration. <laughs> no, no, no Murph. No Murph. <laughs> so I think about that every day now too. <laughs> you know, when everything's being like these center cities are being questioned, you know, right. And, right. And, and, you know, and, you know, when this does end and, you know, it will end and we'll, we will sort of start to see it recede in our in our collective rearview mirror psyche, uh, you know. Um, but what do you think is going to stick? I mean, you know, two years from now, a year from now, what, what? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all thinking about this, right? I can imagine everyone in the audience is thinking about this as well. Um, you know, when I think about cities over the last several decades, you know, post suburbanization. Uh, at least in the New York area, um, there was this real push um, to develop secondary business districts. Um, really good examples of that is um, downtown Brooklyn and Jersey City in New Jersey. And they took a very long time to take off and were in precarious situations as office districts. Um, but it was the notion that from a corporate point of view, you needed a secondary office from a security point of view. There were all these reasons. And from a city point of view, we needed to disaggregate our, our office centers. Um, and like I said, they were slow to take off. They still are in some respects. But what filled in over the more, I would say 20 years as opposed to 40 years, were these residential districts that no one had thought of um, at all. For example, in downtown Brooklyn, they rezoned in 2004 for office and every single one of those buildings is residential today, towers. And then post 9-11 in downtown Manhattan, uh, you know, we have tens of thousands of people living here who, who never lived here before. And that just took off. And that's sort of, you know, the Brooklyn effect, everyone talks about that. And now in Jersey City, it's the same thing. There are so many people living very close to what were considered these secondary business districts. So in turn, they have been supporting those secondary business districts and we're starting to. And I think that trend um, will continue uh, and to support um, these secondary office districts. Mm. Yes, some people will stay in their bucolic homes in Vermont um, because they're allowed to, um, but now we're all allowed to work remotely. Um, and some people will move farther out in the suburbs to get more affordable homes and not come into the city all the time, for sure. Um, but there was a real resurgence of people wanting to live in cities. And I think those people will still wanna live in cities when the uses come back and they will, such as theaters and restaurants. Mm -hmm. And when they do, they will wanna walk to work. They will wanna bike to work, maybe not every day, um, but they will, they will be demanding those things. Um, Dan's a perfect example. I think he's going to be trying to move himself so he can walk to work. Walk to um, work. And I, I, I heard in Europe, they're calling it, or in Paris, it's the 15 minute city. They're trying to disaggregate right. into these right. city pods. And I think that'll be supported. Um, 
post COVID by the fact that you can work remotely, you don't always have to work in the same place. Um, and people want to live in these areas where they can walk to work. Will this be the death knell of uh, primary business districts? They're really at risk. I mean, Midtown in New York right now is, 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 is a very concerning place. Um, but there's value to that place too, because they're international centers. I mean, people need to come someplace and congregate on an international level, on a national level. Um, but those will depend, as I think we all know, probably on this webinar, on innovation in our transportation. And that's beyond the scope of this call or this webinar, uh, this discussion. Um, but, you know, Dan's doing a lot of work in that field as well, and it's critical. Um, renovation of Penn Station, um, what's happening with Grand Central, um, and in particular, New York is doing things that'll come around and, you know, um, so are other municipalities. Um, but if they don't get more federal funding, okay, so Fox, um, we won't have those. And I think the primary business districts are very much at risk mm. post COVID if those things don't happen. If yeah. they do, I think they are needed as well and, and, yeah. and we will support them as well. For sure. Mm. That's a very long view. No, that, that's, what do you think? That's great. Um, well, I, I mean, when you were saying that, I was reflecting not to just uh, like, you know, drag it back to the theme, but I was, when you were talking about these, these districts that were evolving into like the 15 minute, you know, communities, uh, you know, when you think about like the idea of having civic uses at the bottom of, of towers and, you know, that you could, you know, work at 77, I mean, live in 77, drop your kid off at school, walk up to the trades, you know, it's like there is, there is this sort of more polycentric city that, as you say, was was sort of evolving, but but I think COVID really accelerated it. And you know, I do see a more, as opposed to the concentric city where everything's in and out, in and out. I, I see a a real interesting evolution of a of a polycentric, dense city like like New York. And and you know, I think DC has that to some degree too. You know, when you talk think about Bethesda and Tyson's and and and, and Roslyn. And, uh, you know, in the district, I mean, th this sort of sense of, uh, of, of a network city as opposed to a center city is interesting. Anyway, I, I actually think that um, in terms of workplace, that once there's a people feel comfortable traveling on um, public transportation and, and, and once they feel comfortable being back together, whether it's through through better treatment or through vaccine and so forth. I, I think there's going to be a, a strong pendulum back to um, uh, people working together in, in, um, uh, in offices. I mean, we've, we've been so lucky in a way um, uh, that technology, this pandemic happened now and not 15 years ago where we'd be like, what Zoom, you know, and, and or, or all the other devices and things that we've learned. So, I mean, I think there's to cer a certain um, privileged uh, uh, sector of the, of the economy um, and has really been able to continue uh, productively. But, you know, I know in my, in my world, I, I, and I'm amazed by what we're able to produce and what we're able to to deliver to clients and, to create, and continue our creative practice. But in the back of my mind, I'm always like, well, what's lost? You know, what, what, what was the missed opportunity that we didn't have when we're all together, you know? And I also worry a lot about um, the sustainability of this over the long haul. Like how, to, how do we train the next generation of, of developers, architects, lawyers, uh, you know, coders even, I mean, you know, they, we do live in a collaborative world and the things that are not collaborative are rapidly, you know, getting, you know, the computers, AI and so forth, you know, there's, those functions are disappearing. So what's left is where we're really putting our creative minds together. So I, I feel like there's going to be a, a resurgence of, of going back to the office. Why you go back to the office will be a little bit different. It'll be for more collaboration, but but I, I still feel that there, there's a very, very strong place for it. What else you got there, Paul? 
Well, I, 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 I was just going to say we've got uh, a number of questions, which is terrific. Um, I'm going to go back to the very beginning uh, of the uh, webinar, and um, Brad is asking, um, I see churches and public schools as two examples of the non-commercial components of hybrid. Uh, with a severe lack of housing, are there examples of affordable workforce fixed income housing hybrid components uh, to the office commercial uses? So, um, you know, I think that really is a, it's a great question. Um, and what, yeah, the really, I think, forward looking policy. Um, uh, uh, positions that uh, I think um, BC has taken, and I, I really am proud of New York for this. Is is really um, not is creating when when new housing is created is to have an affordable component, whatever you define that. That's sort of integrated through the structure itself, so it's not seen as a separate. Thing. And, and I think that's really important for, for just, you know, just making a good society, you know, that, that really, um, that there is a, a mix of income, a mix of ages, a mix of, uh, you know, demographics. And yeah, Essex Crossing, the example I brought up is 50% affordable in all the buildings interspersed. Um, there's commercial, there's also a senior, well, there's a, a senior affordable building standalone. Um, and this was able to be done in this particular case because the land was so valuable. So you have a land price, and then you have public uses that lower that land price to the city and the city values that and they say, okay, it's worth it for me, it's worth it for me, and there's still money left. It's challenging sometimes because certain parcels of land are not as valuable, so it's hard to get the mix right. Um, but when you can do that financial analysis and find that value, the land's valuable, that's where I also said, that's where the city has to come in sort of in advance and say, we, we've analyzed this, we think you can do this, we're requiring this, and, they, and then they see what, what's left in terms of land value. After that. So there are examples of it. Um, it does have to be on, on, on value, the best, best parcels in whatever city you're in, you know, the most valuable parts. We touched um, just a few moments ago about COVID-19 and I uh, did want to ask the question, uh, perhaps specifically to you, Dan, um, about how uh, FX Collaborative is uh, in their practice, um, in the work that you have underway or in the work that um, is, uh, you know, on the boards, um, how you're, how you're addressing uh, COVID-19. Um, so I, I think I addressed how um, we're working as a group, but I wanna talk about the projects. Uh, you know, I, I sort of, yeah, there's sort of like three scales to this, I, I would say. The first is, um, you know, what I call the plexiglass scale, which is like, really out of our hands. It's when you see this wonderful invention going on in every place you go with, you know, people putting up stanchions and so forth and in restaurants and outdoor seating. It's very organic and, and it's really in a way wonderful to see. Then we're, we're seeing the sort of next scale temporarily is, is things that are, we're in process designing and how are people changing? And we're seeing from our, our um, uh, workplace practice, you know, a, a rethinking of, um, of open offices, not necessarily getting rid of them, but, but reconfiguring them, how they're oriented and, and so forth. And also, as I said before, the reason people will come back to the office is because it's, it's a great place to collaborate. And so really a greater stress on collaborative spaces and, and touchdown spaces and bringing teams together spaces. Um, and then I, I, a lot of the thinking we've been doing is, you know, when you start a major tower or major building, you know, uh, from the day you get, you're lucky enough to get the call or when the, when the, when the award uh, is, you know, from the day it opens could be three or four years, you know, at least, you know, so, 
So, you know, for these larger monumental structures. And so some of the thinking we've been doing is, is really, you know, if we don't have a cure in three years or four years, it ain't going to be a building, you know, it's going to be, you know, so, but the idea of pandemics and the reality of pandemics are with us. And it really has start at, uh, got us to question some of the basic underlying um, assumptions about how you plan these high rise buildings. And, you know, there's been such a um, sort of directive towards efficiency. So, you know, uh, Cass Gilbert who designed the, uh, who designed the Woolworth building said, you know, a high rise is a machine to make the, to make the land pay. <laughs> and so when you have that as a sort of undergirding um, uh, point of view for, for buildings, you know, it's all about efficiency. And, you know, my worry is that we've, we've gotten too efficient and you can see that in some of the high rise buildings that, that have been designed where everything is like designed perfectly and optimized to ideal conditions. But then when there's a pandemic and we can only load a third of the number of people in the elevators or a quarter of the people on the floor that we were designed it for, they're not very resilient, you know? And, uh, you know, my favorite quote is uh, Stuart Brand who said, uh, all buildings are predictions and all predictions are wrong. You know, so it's sort of like we have to sort of think a little less about efficiency, a little bit more about pandemic resiliency, that these buildings can flex a little bit more between and better and more effectively between um, normative um, normative mode and, and pandemic mode so that, you know, elevator lobbies and elevators and, 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 and the whole public sequences into buildings can, you know, under like a health scare can really remain functioning and support the thing. And, and, and the, the funny thing is, as we've been getting into this, especially on high rise office buildings, we've been discovering that it makes the normative uh, condition better, you know, and more interesting. And, and so, it's good to, to shake things up uh, if you, that's there. Miriam, I wonder if you had a, you wanted to add anything to that question. Um, no, I thought, I thought Dan answered it really um, beautifully. It's just, it, it is a conundrum. I mean, you plan these buildings so far in advance and they're buildings like you, they're, they're essentially set. Yeah. So, how do you turn that around with flexibility? And Dan is right, it's gonna put pressure, he's actually right on some of the efficiency discussions. Um, and those discussions are always undergirded with how much it costs. Like you're trying to make it efficient so you can afford it. Right. That's, that's gonna be super challenging. You know, I do wonder, it, you know, especially the losers in this conversation will be the older buildings. Um, and if you love older buildings, it's really concerning, you know, older office buildings, any other older building. Um, and I keep on thinking, you know, there's a lot of MEP <laughs> innovation out there. And how can we support uh, the renovation of these buildings? You know, how can cities, as part of their thoughts, you know, innovate with tax credits for folks so that they can invest in their buildings. You know, there's there are some programs for environmental uh, energy upgrades that people can tap into. And I'm wondering if those same resources can be supersized and be about um, hygiene as well, um, because we're going to need to we're, we're going to need those dollars um, in, in the new new post pandemic design and, and activation of these buildings. Well, once again, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that I work in a historic building um, and that uh, one of the earliest innovations of air circulation uh, were found in that building. Um, sadly, uh, it's not utilized these days just because we are a museum and need to control the environment. Um, but I know very well uh, of what you uh, speak. Um, about you know good air circulation and uh, um, you know maintaining distance, and we went from cubicles to open office space, 
uh, and now, you know, uh, we'll be rethinking that um, very seriously uh, as we move forward. Um, you know, I said the older buildings are going to are, are somewhat, you know, in a precarious situation. But that said, they do have windows that open. Yes, very true. And I see that actually coming back. Mm -hmm. And I think you went with me. We went on a curtain wall trip to Europe yeah. 20 years ago. And European office buildings have operable windows, yeah, natural, yeah. And so that might be part of the innovation in the American context. I mean, and along those lines and what you were saying, Paul, about, you know, um, like the building, the historic building that the National Building Museum is, or, or the big loft buildings that we're, we love so much uh, in New York is that, you know, there's a, also going back to Stuart Brand, you know, is like loose, loose fit, you know, that in a way the National Building Museum was not a very efficient building, but it was, just, it's certainly a resilient building. I mean, it, you know, in terms of its uses and, and, and probably from a, you know, a ability to flex. And, you know, when, when I talked before about, um, you know, having more gracious and more, uh, you know, commodious, public sequences and so forth like that. And we were talking about this in the office and someone said, it's like a, it's like a 1910 school, you know, where you have, or the municipal building in lower Manhattan where there's just big, gracious, big things. And, and that's what, that's sort of, you know, we, we've squeezed everything. So I, sometimes the, the planning of the historical buildings can be a little looser and a little looser fit. So I think it depends. And going back to what Miriam said, I think it's a very key point about, um, incentivizing supporting um you know the reuse of the building stock with and, and in addition to you know grants and things like that but the zoning also you know I, a lot of i've been thinking a lot about the parallels and non-parallels between this and like the post 9 11 world and you know after 9 11 there was this whole soul searching about the effect, efficacy and you know, of office buildings and tall buildings and you know, there was a movement and it, it's done it. it was like adding more stairs into buildings. And, um, you know, at least in New York, uh, you know, uh, from above a certain height, you're, you have to put in uh, the third stair, but that third stair doesn't count against your zoning. And likewise, from a sustainability point of view, there's, there's zoning incentives for, for greater insulation and so forth. And so I do think, a hygiene, public hygiene, public health has got to enter into the conversation once again. Well, I'm incredibly grateful to uh, both you, Dan Kaplan and Miriam Harris uh, for joining us this evening. Um, and to all of you who have uh, been viewing us this evening and sending in your questions, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, um, uh, but I wish you all uh, good health, stay well, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Take care. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.